Welcome, everybody. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. I'm okay with you guys. I'll go ahead and get started. Yep. Everybody ready? Um, I'm Blythe Bailey. I'm the administrator of Chattanooga's Department of Transportation. Also, want to uh, talk about our team. I'll just if you if you'll just raise your hand if you're on the city team. If you're wearing a name tag. Um, so there are various folks here with the city. Not all of us have speaking roles, but um, there's uh, both consultants who work for us as well as city staff. Uh, both from the Departments of Transportation, Economic and Community Development Department, and uh, Parks Planner. Um, some of you were probably here, um, I believe it was September, I want to say it was September 20th of 2014, almost two years ago in this very space. We talked about this project then, but I'll say something very similar to what I said then, that as the administrator of the Department of Transportation, I believe that our streets should be safe, they should be friendly for all people, they should be good for neighborhoods, um, they should be comfortable to walk on, they should be comfortable to bike on, they should be comfortable and safe to drive on, and they should provide connections. Um, and one of the things that we try to do in the department is we create as many alternatives as, as we can. That's not just alternatives for how you move around in terms of the mode that you may choose. And creating a good street grid is the best way to assure uh, the minimum amount, amount of traffic inconvenience for our system. And it's also the best way to assure that people have connections to things. I believe that this project is very important for the entire community um, because it creates a new connection, a very, very new, uh, a new, a new, very important connection. Um, the project, at one time, years and years ago, was conceived as a highway, um, a high-speed, high-volume highway. We don't run that kind of transportation department anymore. Uh, we don't think that a high-speed highway um, through neighborhoods and through areas of the city is productive. Uh, we think that our streets, like I said, should be comfortable and safe for everybody to be on. And I don't want to steal the thunder of our team on the details, but we have been very committed from the beginning to making sure that this is a calm, comfortable street for everybody in terms of how they need to move around. Um, and we're committed to that, always have been committed to that, and committed to that all the way through uh, this project. So with that said, Scott Neeson is the, uh, the main lead on the project with our consulting team, Reagan Smith. Um, he has, he'll, I'll let him introduce his team as, as he deems appropriate, and he'll get into it, and then he'll take questions at the end. If you all would hold your questions until the end of the presentation, I think there's about 25 slides. Uh, I know that many of you are familiar with the project, so if Scott goes through, Quick, quicker than you want and you have questions, we can certainly go back, but, um, but hopefully we can get to a point where you all can give us your input and, and we get some good feedback. With that said, um, unless I forgot anything, I'll turn it over to Scott. Sounds good. Thanks again, everybody, for being here. Appreciate it, Blythe. I'm going to pull over here to get out of the way uh, by the trash can here. So um, appreciate everybody coming out again. Uh, like I said, today we're going we're gonna to give a, a, a good overview of what we've been working on for now. Uh, four or five years. Uh, we're going to talk about the environmental and design process um, that we've been through, uh, what we've been working on. We're going to talk specifically about the environmental studies that we've done and the findings of those environmental studies. We are going to, again, visit about the conceptual plan, which has evolved, and uh, we'll present that to you and also present why it has evolved in the manner that it has. Uh, like Blythe said, we'll have a question and answer period at the end, and I think we should um, cover most of that through, through our discussion, but we'll, we'll be here as long as we need to be. And then again, you should see handouts. If you didn't receive a handout, uh, there are comment cards there. We're still receiving comments. We'd love your feedback. The project does have quite a history. Uh, there's been discussion about this project since the late 50s, early 60s, and as Blythe has said, it's really evolved and changed over time. The project's been in the Long Range Transportation Plan here in Chattanooga since 2004. So that, that was a, uh, a decision at that time to go ahead and um, start thinking about this roadway in a more substantial way and start to start thinking about dedicating dollars uh, to the project at that time. Over, uh, over the last few years, in 2012, we were funded, uh, the city funded the project to move forward. When that funding occurs, that's when we really start developing what 
what the lay of the land is. When we really start to understand the lay of the land, we, the funding does talk about going from A to B, but it doesn't necessarily name the route. That's what we've been doing for the last four years. Um, as we've moved on, I know we've had a number of public meetings, and uh, I see a lot of familiar faces, and have had a lot of, a lot of very good in, input, input that has changed the project as, we, as we've gone along. Uh, two items of note here that are, are worthwhile is, uh, we did have quite a bit of time trying to get access to all the properties to do all the technical studies for the environmental work. That has slowed us down considerably. So that happened in March of this year, and we were allowed to finish all of our technical studies and submit uh, beginning parts of, of the technical documents to TDOT to start letting them review those technical documents. That's where we are right now. We're starting to submit things to TDOT. We're not finished, we're not at the finish line, but we can see it. And um, so TDOT's starting to feed back information. All of the discussion that occurs today and all the comments we receive will be part of the record. So we're encouraging continued uh, input on the project. The purpose of the project, um, you know, obviously we, this should be a familiar slide if you've been here to other public meetings. Of course, we're trying to get system linkage, trying to tie the roadway network together. Uh, we've talked about improving emergency response time for vehicles headed to and from Erlanger, uh, accommodate growth as, as it's to come, and certainly relieve traffic between 3rd Avenue and Riverside Drive. 3rd Street and Riverside Drive, not only um, on this route, but adjacent routes as well to a certain extent. So the project study area, has a number of constraints that has helped drive where, uh, where this project is going. Um, I know this is, again, something, some things you're very familiar with. Um, we've, through the process of going and learning about this study area, we've identified a number of very important things that we want to avoid uh, and need to avoid. Certainly, uh, you could go right down the list um, and uh, we need to work with, with Erlanger. We need to avoid the former Cumberland Corporation building. We don't want to split Tennessee American Water Facility for safety purposes. Uh, we want to preserve the, the green space that is currently the recreational land on Erlanger. Hopefully, obviously, the future um, park area refurbished for Lincoln Park. So these are starting to be the guiding principles to identify where this study needs to focus as we, we go through. Um, there it is in writing uh, some of those, those key constraints that really started to drive and mold this project as we've learned more and more about it. Also, uh, obviously the NEPA studies, that's the environmental studies, are other driving factors that help us to kind of hone in on where this, this route should go, uh, what important features we need to avoid. And with that, um, I'm going to let Jeff and uh, Jeff Weisner and Jeff Coots come and talk a little bit. They are our environmental engineers. Let them talk for a minute about each of the studies that have taken place. It's not all in advance. Oh, all right. So, so anyway, um, yeah, thanks, Scott. So, to do the environmental studies, Scott talked about the constraints. That's the first thing we do is we we roll out the map. We come in, we try to invest, investigate, you know, the area, the community, and find out what's at stake. And then we try to uh, you know, work the best we can to, to create a project that avoids um, wherever possible. And then if we can't avoid it, then we try to minimize any, any impacts, okay? And so what we do is we go through this process and we study a whole range of environmental uh, things, you know, from archaeology, historic architecture, Native American uh, coordination is something that's also important for this project. Uh, section 4F and Section 6F, those are some technical things that just involve public space. Okay, wherever there's a public space, there's a certain set of laws that go along with that that we have to comply with. Um, it gets kind of detailed, and if you have questions about that, I can answer them in detail later on, but it's something we do consider. And then community impacts, environmental justice issues, social justice, those are things that concern us, and so we, we take a good hard look at that. Natural resources, noise and air quality, hazardous materials, floodplain impacts, right of way and relocation, large concern, and of course, um, the pedestrian and bicycle are the multimodal types of elements. 
Uh, start off with the archaeology. Uh, archaeology, you know, is, is you know those prehistoric and historic resources that, that might be out there under the ground that we um, aren't quite aware of. And so we go through this process of once we know where our alignment's going to be, we send a crew out there. They actually dig holes and they sift the dirt and they look for artifacts, um, evidence of prehistoric uh, communities and. and and evidence of, of, of our past. And so we do that, we want to uh, go through this very deep process to identify that and we document that. And then we have to work with the, the state archaeology and sometimes federal agencies, depending on what we find, and, and go through the process that's very particular that they outline that we have to do. Okay, and so that's, that's what we've done there. With historical and uh, architectural resources, uh, I know many of you know that we've come out and we've done a historic uh, uh, analysis. And the uh, Cumberland Corporation was uh, one resource that was determined to be eligible for listing on what's called the National Register of Historic Places. And so there's a whole set of criteria that we go through when we evaluate uh, potentially historic resources. Okay? And then we work with the state, uh, with TDOT, and with the federal government to determine if they're eligible for listing on the nat National Register. And in some cases, there's already a documented resource there. And by all means, we try to avoid and minimize impacts to those, those resources. That has to go along with that Section 4F thing that was back there. That's kind of the laws and things that tell us that we have to do certain things <coughs> to minimize impacts. Native American coordination. Uh, this is something that, that goes along with all of the cultural resource investigations, cultural resources being both the historic and the archaeological uh, things. So these are all the different uh, Indian uh, nations and tribes that we've uh, corresponded with. Uh, this is also uh, handled at the state level with, with TDOT, and uh, you know the ones that have responded in writing. I don't know if we've got the star there. there we go. Okay. Yeah, these are starred because these are the ones that have actually responded to the correspondence. We have to send out a letter, tell them what the action we're taking, the, the project that we're proposed, and give them an opportunity to comment. It's called consultation process, and so we did get three responses back. And uh, so far, they've, they've indicated that they, they don't have any um, particular and in, in-depth in concerns. There are certain things we have to follow. If we do find an artifact, there's a process we go through to, to make sure that things are properly documented. Here's Section 4F. Uh, public really applies to the public parks and, and open spaces and public facilities. And so we, we did you know, go look at all the different criteria that are involved there. The Cumberland Corporation, as a historic resource, <coughs> would have applied. So that's something that, you know, Scott mentioned, we had to be very careful that we uh, try to avoid in impacts to that. And right now we have no neg negative impacts that have been determined from our, our studies. Section 6F, that has to do with federal funding for park facilities. We don't have that in this, in this circumstance, so that doesn't apply. Community impact assessment, environmental justice. Uh, community impact assessment is done um, FHWA has a, a, a guideline, and we call it the Purple Book in our business. And the Purple Book tells us how and the things that we should look at when we go through when we study a community. We look at things like community cohesion. We look at um, uh, things like uh, community resources. You know, what, what, do the com what does the community you know, rely upon for resources in the, in the area? We look at the economics. We look at development trends, growth management. You know, how is growth being managed? Is it being managed through? Um, uh, land use ordinances and restrictions and, and things like that. And then from that we, uh, you know, apply our assessment of, of what's going on. And, you know, quickly here what we did realize is that there are some things that work within the community. I know there's a big concern for what's called gentrification, which means, you know, making it so that a lot of people cannot afford to no, uh, live in their, their, their community anymore. They could, you couldn't buy your own house if you moved out. And so these are things that are a concern for communities and uh, is a con concern for us too. And so what we did as part of our analysis was to look at, at that and what's at work within the community. There are a lot of things going on here that are driving property values. Maybe some of you have been approached already by people you know, wanting to buy um, homes and to put together larger parcels of land and, and do whatever they want to do with it. And so connectivity, having a, a road extension could be a factor that does contribute to that. But there's so many other things at work with regard to um, you know, how you protect that community as a resource, such as zoning and you know, those other development ordinances. And you as a community, how you want to respond to that guy that wants to come up with a load of money 
um, and, and try to bar, you know, buy your parcel and, and put it together for other purposes. So um, we can talk in more in detail about that uh, later on if you wish. Um, natural resources are a big thing. Sitico Creek um, is, is you know, a feature on the project that's, that's very important. We have to deal with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the permitting process that, that goes there. And we've chosen to, to bridge Sitico Creek. Uh, a lot of times the approach will be to, to put in a culvert and, and put in some fill perhaps to, to, to cross that. Uh, more sensitive treatment is to, to put in a bridge is what we've done here. Uh, air quality, it does conform to the state implementation plan. Um, there's a whole lot of rules and things with regard to air quality and we've done an in-depth analysis and we have a, a, a document that addresses air quality. And we found out there's no adverse effects in the long term there. Noise is something else that we look at. We um, go out and we do noise surveys, we set up equipment, and we take readings and all this stuff, and then we put it in a, in a model, and the model tells us uh, if there's a possibility for impacts, where that impact area is. And so we did all that complicated stuff, and we came out, and, and there's no negative impacts. And what goes into the noise study, of course, is the amount of traffic, how fast the traffic's going. Those are the two big things that Oh, and the ambient noise that's, that's in an area already. So we looked at the ambient noise, we looked at the roadway, what happens if we increase the traffic volumes, what happens if we increase the speed. Speed is a big thing when it comes to roadway noise. And so what we try to do is try to cre create a design that keeps the speed down and uh, will lessen the noise. So we have that there. Floodplains, we have some minor impacts with regard to, to Citigo Creek. And so again, we uh, proposed a bridge there. Hazardous materials investigations. Scott mentioned having to coordinate with the railroads. Uh, that took us a long time to do. We finally got that coordination. They allowed us access so we could go in there and finish up our investigations for hazardous materials. We did uh, not do hazardous materials oh, on the railroad. Um, no, not they on the did railroad. Not allow us to no, do no, no, no. I'm sorry. I misspoke. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I misspoke. But we did have to work in and around the, the railroad there. Um, you know, the railroad is very sensitive to the right of way. So. Yes, sir. Could you repeat that? You did no testing on the railroad? We did it adjacent. Adjacent, adjacent. To, not within the right of way. We could not gain access from them to actually do testing on their property. Okay. Somebody's been out there testing. There's uh, been some geotechnical testing. Yeah, the geotechnical is a little bit different. Um, if, they ge if they do the geotechnical investigation and they do run into anything, they, they are obligated to report that because they do drill um, test holes, right? Yes. Who is it that does geotechnical testing? Part of our team. It's, you know, okay. Geoscience is just the company. Mm -hmm. Right away on relocations, uh, you know, we, we always look at that. We don't have any residential. Uh, and no business impacts you know, with regard to you know, having to relocate people. Um, uh, bicycle and pedestrian connect connectivity, we are proposing some new sidewalks and a multi-use path and connection to the Tennessee River Walk. Oh, I'm sorry, we do have a, an impact to an Arlander building. What Arlander building would that be? Their maintenance building in the back. It's a big... Uh, the one I think is probably... Is it, yeah, yeah, it's blue. Yeah. Yeah, you may have no. seen it. Well, good. That's it. Okay. Um, so we've talked about constraints. We've talked about what we found from the environmental studies. And we've come through this process and identified a number of changes that need to be made, made through the project. Um, and those are going to be further documented here as I show you both the, the conceptual layout as well as a perspective view. But some of the major changes are highlighted here. The original project talked about a four lane or five lane roadway. The neighborhood and public input was desire, desire to have a, a lesser roadway. We're going with the two lane roadway on this project. Well, wait a minute, Scott, we decided not to have a road. At all. <laughs> the, we decided not to yeah. have a road at all. No road. The, uh, I appreciate it. We'll, 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 let me finish. We'll, we'll, we'll get after it after that. Um, the alignment, the alignment has changed. Uh, the alignment has changed uh, to certainly avoid the park area, to avoid Cumberland Corporation building, to lessen impacts on the railroad. The, uh, the Lincoln Park redevelopment has been proposed by the city as part of this project as an outcome of this project. It is a separate project, but it is something that the city has proposed and it has been a change to the, to the overall 
idea through this area uh, as part of public input and, and desires for those things. And traffic calming features are also things that have changed in this project and been added to the project uh, as a result of, of public input and, and desires for um, slower speed roadway through this area. So here and also on the wall, we do have it in your, in your handouts. You'll see the conceptual layout as it stands today. Yeah, we didn't get it. Do you have any more? Yes, ma'am. Right Absolutely. I, I put a stack at the end of the table. If folks this way would pass this way, everybody would, uh, would be able I'll to that, guys. Did you guys all get some? Yeah. So again, the conceptual layout, as you can see, uh, starts. So the conceptual layout, as you can see, ties it, starts at Third Street on the south end and ties it in at Riverside Drive on the north end at signalized intersection. The layout features two two lanes of traffic, 11 foot lanes. Um, it features a, uh, a, a desirable tie-in on Wheel Street, um, and it features a pedestrian crossing here at Cleveland Street across Cleveland uh, Central Avenue has, has been promised to the neighborhood and discussed previously. Wait, what, what type of crossing you say that was? It would be a uh, similar a, a push button signalized crossing. So and I heard you say wheel. Wheel Street. Wheel is up from the Yes, ma'am. That's been part of the study all along. We're um, we're looking at that option. That's what the city wants to do. Railroad and Erlanger maybe doesn't want us to do that. That will be part of the process of the right of way negotiation. So there's some some moving parts there. But again, to kind of get a better perspective of what this what this roadway will look like, we try to put this at a little bit of a uh, walking eye, walking on the sidewalk, so we can show some of these features. Two lane roadway, 11 foot lanes, narrow lanes. On street parking, again in response, I think, to both Erlanger, I think wants parking. I know the neighborhood has asked about parking adjacent to the park property uh, that's on the right side of this perspective. Um, grass strips, landscaped uh, grass strips, street trees, lighting for safety. On the, on the far side, we're talking uh, about a 12 foot wide shared use path for anything from bicyclists to strollers to, um, to families and the, and the like. We thought that was a good place for the shared use path adjacent to, uh, adjacent to the park. So that hopefully gives uh, a different look at this than what we've shown previously. It's uh, a little bit more of a walking person's eye. Scott, Going through the features. Scott, yes, ma'am. Sorry to interrupt you so much. Don't go so fast now. We'll, where we'll, is come, the, we'll be here all night. Okay, where is the park? <laughs> the, the park would be on the far side. Yes, ma'am. In fact, we try to kind of mimic the building that's there as well as the the, um, the ballpark. Okay, so, so And you can see it. You'll be able to see it a little bit better here because you can get up to it and really look at it. So you're trying to say the only parking that we have is street parking for the, to access the park? We are talking about putting on-street parking on the street. That's which not is, too much parking, Scott. Especially when we have events. Um, this, it may be helpful. Um, Akosha is here as the parks planner. Um, we, as you know, we've tried to. This is our project, the street project. Um, we we heard, I think, from you that we needed parking to address the park many months, if not years ago. <coughs> so we accommodated that through on-street parking, which also has an additional benefit of the traffic calming elements. The streets that have parking on them typically make drivers drive more cautiously. So we're not suggesting that that is all of the parking that the park will need. As we go develop a park, which is not in CDOT's purview, but it's in Koshua's purview, um, if, the, if that's one of the things that, that emerges from the process of working with the neighborhood and others that have an that have that want to have input on the park, then we could potentially provide more parking 
in the development of the park. Do you understand what I'm saying? I hear you, Blythe, but a lot of times things don't come to fruition when you start and then, you know, we're wanting more parking. It just left out. Yeah. It's always left and out. And I'm just saying, well, I'll, I'll keep an eye on that to the extent that I can to make sure that y'all exactly. have Exactly. That's, that's the key yeah. thing to the extent you can. Well, Coach, you want to raise your hand let everybody know that you're here. So she, she's going to be engaging in an exercise. She will, she will likely reach out to this group as a core group. I hope I'm not speaking too much on your behalf. Do you want to? No, I'm, yeah, I think uh, it's very early, but we're hoping at least before the end of September or October to have the initial uh, meeting where we engage the neighborhood to get some of your um, feedback on the desired park elements so we can begin the design process. It, we're still working out the contract, but Trust for Public Land would be facilitating the public engagement portion of that process. And I guess do the requirements on this specific traffic, um, I mean transportation project. We're just discussing the park design development, but not anything beyond that. Yeah, that's the thing. Though. See, some things need to be discussed pre before something like this, because I'm not for sure how you're going to handle four or 500 cars showing up here. It's going to limit us to events. But well, we'll be able to, when we, again, I'm speaking for you, but I think once we get into the process of working through the park, that would be something that we would consider there, I think, as it relates to the street, which is the project that we're responsible for, providing the on-street parking maximizes the amount of parking <coughs> that you can get out of the street alone. Um, and then if there's need for if there's need for more parking for big events that happen, then that would be addressed during the park planning phase, which is going to start very soon. <laughs> yeah, should, that should be addressed before this. That's well, what I'm saying. We, we won't have a problem incorporating both. Um, I don't know if you've gotten to the schedule. Maybe you can address the schedule, but we'll be able to coordinate the park development with the street development in terms of how you access parking lots or how you access the park from the street. We'll, we'll have plenty of time to do that. Um, walking again through some of the other design features. Uh, we talked about traffic calming, 11 foot lanes, on street parking, non linear alignment, low speed design, 30 mile an hour design speed. Here. Pedestrian features, including sidewalks and shared use path, pedestrian scale lighting, and the crossing that we've talked about a push button crossing signal at Cleveland Street and Blackbird to cross a, across Central Avenue. Uh, landscaping, as I mentioned, grass buffers between the roadway and the street, street trees. Other features, um, the Norfolk Southern property will be an underpass to go under their, their property. There will be a bridge over Sitico Creek and a new, new traffic light at uh, Amicola Pike. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We got to go Pike. under uh, something? Yes, ma'am. What's the <laughs> elevation of that underpass? <laughs> well, as, as the lay of the land, that is the oh, high point. So it, we could have potentially gone over or under, and it seemed to work a lot better to go under. Is there a 10 foot tunnel, a 9 foot tunnel? It'll be, it'll be, uh, no. I, I would think with federal dollars we'll be required to make it 16 foot tunnel. So. And you said under, is the traffic going to be going under or just the pedestrian? Pede both. The oh. traffic and pedestrians will go under the railroad property. So. And, and that's not what I'm, what I'm understanding. I'm not understanding why you can't do this somewhere else opposed to going through Lincoln Park if you're going under. We've, we've looked, as you know, we've looked extensively through this entire area to well, try and find a connection that also satisfies the purpose and need for the project. And I don't think we've stopped short of looking at any option. We've looked at them all. So you've looked at that? What I just suggested. We've looked at other options in this area to look at other routes, and this was the route that most you know, satisfied the purpose and need of the project. Mm -hmm. But did the, you look at the, what I just suggested as far as going <coughs> under, but starting back opposed to going through the park? Oh, starting starting further back. Oh, yeah. uh, no, we haven't. We, I don't know that we have looked at that. So those are good comments. That's what we're here for. We'll take those comments. Let me ask you something. Since this is going to be done anyway, and the purpose is to get from East Third Street to Amicola. Yes, ma'am. What's wrong with Holmes Club? Pardon? What's wrong with Holmes Club? That's a four-lane highway going 
a boom high singer has been leveled, mm -hmm. you gotta put a bridge there somewhere anyway. So what's wrong with putting a bridge there? You know, ultimately, we're trying to get more connectivity, more routes, give opportunities for people to drive from different routes. This is going to allow pedestrian and pedestrian and bicycle connectivity to the river river walk area. This is going to allow uh, emergency vehicles to, to respond quicker. And so there are, there are a number of, of uh, you know, purpose and need items for why this route is desirable. Uh, for, Yes. Uh, moving forward, um, and we'll, again, we're going to be here, and we'll, we'll discuss what you, whatever we need to. Uh, so we're we're looking again for input today. We are getting feedback from TDOT uh, on a weekly basis, and we will be resubmitting, uh, responding to their comments with our formal categorical exclusion uh, NEPA document if you will, our environmental document in, uh, in the fall. And we hope to get an approval uh, in, in late fall of that document. So after that, we would hope that uh, we can get through the, des the formal design process and get to right away acquisition and utility coordination in the summer, uh, next summer. And then uh, after that occurs, when we look at construction to start in fall of 2018, with about a two year construction period. So, what you're saying all together, it's already, it's already, it's already, it's already right? Yeah. So we're going to I'll say this, <laughs> we've gone through all this process. I know what you've gone through, I've been there with you now, I've been there with you. So in essence, We've gone through this been... process to identify appropriate location and appropriate features for this roadway. Right now, our desire and our intention is to put the roadway in as we're showing it here. That is our, and it has and it has morphed and changed more times than any of us. It hasn't changed too far, Scott, from the beginning. Uh, um, it has changed and morphed quite a bit. And I mean, since Reese has been straightened, but other than that, not too, too much. Yeah, it's the same road going through. It's still going through the problem. It's just still going through. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, like I said, we've been meeting for three or four years. And I can see if you had, you know, put side by side what we had suggested also and said, this is why this can't work. But well, we're still going back to whatever you guys planned from the beginning. Yeah. We're just I, having the meetings. That's just to let us know it's a done deal. He just said 2018, with two years to go. So by 2020, it's a done deal. Yeah. I'm here. I hear that. Okay, this is just the process you go through. The uh, your information and your comment cards are still being received and will be part of the record that goes in to uh, the DOT and FHWA. Uh, we we want to get all of those um, comment cards in as well. Uh, that's it for the formal presentation. We're more than welcome to take on questions and 